The United States Geological Survey is a government agency in the United States Department of the Interior. Since establishment in March of 1879, the center of activity for the USGS continues to be the surveying and mapping of resources. It comes as no surprise that the U.S. would dedicate 142 years of major surveying efforts to the claim of land as material wealth. But I understand maps to be documents capable of story, meaning, futuring, and world-making. I imagine maps with higher aspirations. The USGS maintains a data set titled the Mineral Resource Data System, collected from 1996 through 2017. It contains thousands of records related to mineral prospects and mines in the U.S. and around the world. Mindout.org lists 13 definitions of the term prospect. A prospect is an area that is a potential site of mineral deposits, sometimes an area that has been explored in a preliminary way but is not given evidence of economic value. A prospect is distinct from a mine in that it is non-producing. All 13 definitions refer to the ground as property, value, wealth, or economic importance in some sense. 12 denotes the actual specimen or sample of mineral obtained from a small amount of pay dirt or ore. And as a verb, the final listing describes the working of a place experimentally in order to ascertain its richness in precious minerals. There are 1,089 listings in the MRDS with the title Unknown Prospect throughout the state of Utah, which is first and foremost the ancestral territory of the Ute, Paiute, Diné, Hopi, Zuni, Ute Mountain Ute, and Goshute tribes. This project is named for the peculiar listings that never materialized. Unknown Prospect is made up of a particular place on a map but also a body of work surveying so-called public lands through story and pigments. Prospect becomes the act of looking forward, an extensive view. It is a practice of design research as making that investigates ochres to make maps and drawings, archives, books, and catalogs that reveal erased histories and alternative futures in each of the sites. The performance of assembling ochres is as critical as their subsequent deployment in products of design. Ochre not only makes color material, it activates its own agency in world making. The San Rafael Swell is a geological anomaly at the edge of the Colorado Plateau, an anticline pushed up 60 million years ago during the Laramide orogeny. It measures roughly 64 kilometers wide and 121 kilometers long. Erosion has revealed millions of years of geological time exposed to the desert sun along the reef edge. An ancient marine environment left us the Chinle Formation in the Triassic period, a formation marked by colorful instances of oxidation or reduction based on fluctuating sea levels and water conditions, tracing soft and friable pigments with variety of hue and memory. Sometimes the flickering lights pick out traces of life along the river, imprints of ferns that lined its banks and creatures that lived in its waters. Sometimes they find the tracks of the dinosaurs that roamed the last and lushest of the plains. The Colorado Plateau traverses thousands of vertical meters in diverse stratified layers. From the variable ground level, the body is minuscule and useless in scale. Access to these strata is facilitated either by natural erosion and water, or by industrial interventions, road cuts, and tailings piles. Then the real costs of uranium hunting begin to mount as a bulldozer climbs the sheer mesa wall. Laboriously, it cuts out a precipitous and narrow road for the drill rig and trucks to follow. Providing access to the mine roads are hundreds of other roads leading to the claim areas built by mining companies and the government. The ochre places I visit are mining sites that range in status from claim to reclamation. Some are noted as potential in the geological survey but left alone. Others were active at some point in our industrial past, but are now abandoned. One remains an active mining operation. Unknown prospect becomes an iterative atlas of these sites. Ochre becomes a medium for dismantling dualisms that pertain to land use and human interaction in these desert places. Dualisms that maintain the power of colonial practices of extraction, mining, grazing, and recreation. All of which deny the dignity and agency of the non-human to create sanitized public lands interpreted as material resource or isolated backcountry. These extraction histories led me to another tactic of erasure in the U.S., the practice of slavery. Historical documents describe the establishment of the Spanish Trail that traverses the swell from east to west for the displacement of enslaved indigenous women and children. The search for ochre bodies has revealed the human bodies of the anthroponaut scene. The San Rafael Swell is far from pristine wilderness, despite the state tourism office trying to sell you rugged terrain. This vast landscape is formed by human intervention. 
In the field, my body's obvious responsibility is walking and gathering, but more important is a sensing of environment, becoming with color, without sight. Riding waves of energy that emanate from ancient earths or drift in on the dry winds that form them. In this practice, it is the relationship between body and geology that reveals color. Ochre bodies are iron in a geological sense, while my own body is iron in the sense of flesh and blood. I understand pigment as an extension or dimension of the ochre body. Humans have been becoming with ochre for a very long time. Red ochre, or iron oxide, is one of the most abundant minerals on the earth, and humans have been engaging it as medicine, as art, and as divine agent for approximately 300,000 years, if one relies on the archeological record. I am drawn to ochres primarily through the physical practice of working with them. Similar to my preference for drafting with a pencil or setting type, these are the physical acts of making ideas manifest, not only abstract gestures of the mind. I have several parameters to navigate the ethics of my material process. I collect materials that have been discarded or disrupted by previous mining activity in road cuts and tailing piles, or materials that have been released by natural erosion and washes that will otherwise be overturned by the next rainfall. The process of collection itself is a conversation with each site. Fieldwork is not always about collection or taking. Sometimes it is about being with and experiencing the more than human. I've only begun to untangle my relationship as designer with that of matter. This question is vital to resisting a disciplinary tendency towards control and distortion of the non-human, which we must begin to understand as an extension of ourselves. The MRDS includes deposit name, location, commodity, deposit description, geologic characteristics, production, reserves, resources, and references. I preserve site descriptors from the database, such as MRDS 1008-9646, not as names, but instead as markers of particular encounters between the sites and the industrial capitalist system that has described them as particular grounds for particular purpose, extraction. I'm building an archive compiled of field visits, ochre practice, imaging and analysis, divergent histories, and publication in print and book form. In this slow process, color is not abstract. It's not a code or a swatch from a digital library. It's not even mixed by hand via a set of predetermined ratios of 12 base colors. Color is a result of geological being in the world. The color has history, has significance, has meaning. It comes from somewhere, but it also is someone. It has agency and desires of its own. Ochre embeds this knowing in the documents and products it occupies. The U.S. Geological Survey accomplishes its total and complete conversion of earth beings into cash money through products like the MRDS and it carefully monitors the national stockpile of material wealth. As an alternative, Unknown Prospect contemplates earth beings through their human and more than human stories and extends relational dimensions through design practice. The practice I present here is one model for reintegrating the human designer with the nature they design in and from and with, so that culture is not seen as distinct from the raw material or nature it is composed of. As a designer, I position myself in dialogue with ochre as a world-making agent. I'm in search of paths to understand difference beyond hierarchy so that we might dismantle dualisms through reconstruction of relationship and identity, as ecofeminist Val Plumwood suggests. What if the design process began with the needs of the other, the more than human? What if it began with what the more than human has experienced and seen? Ochres reveal more questions than answers. They reveal potential lines of flight rather than discrete locations in space.